Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we will be having our MBQIP webinar. This topic um, is over antibiotic stewardship um, in the area of implementation, overview, what's new. We hosted an um, antibiotic stewardship webinar, Sarah. It's been probably probably two or three years ago, I want to say. Um, and we have it on YouTube, and it's one of our top reviewed webinars um, recordings on YouTube. And so, um, Zoom we meeting are, for antibiotic stewardship. We are really looking forward um, to this session as well. And as I mentioned, we had a great um, registration for this one. If you're catching this on YouTube or the recording, and you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. We are a smaller group on the live call, so if you have questions, you can unmute your line or put a question in the chat box. So with that said, Sarah, I will turn it over to you. Um, thanks, Laura. Uh, so as Laura said, my name is Sarah Brinkman, and I am coming to you from Stratus Health. I'll tell you a little bit about our organization and the role that we play in supporting uh, quality and critical access hospitals. I'm excited to be with you today to talk about antibiotic stewardship implementation. Um, I am a particularly informal presenter. I much prefer to have this be a conversation. There's a lot of knowledge in the room and want to make sure that we are allowing time and space for those um, connections to take place. You can see from the letters after my name, none of those letters indicate that I am clinical in nature or that I am a uh, a pharmacist. So if you are a pharmacist, if you have clinical background, if there are questions that come up, you all have a lot of expertise to offer as well. I'm going to give you some of the basics and the background about the antibiotic stewardship measure and review some of the data, um, most recent data for critical access hospitals in Oklahoma as it relates to that. But please don't be shy about unmuting or weighing in in the chat. So to give you a little bit of background about Stratus Health, we are an independent nonprofit. We're based in Minnesota. Uh, we've been around for just over 50 years. And uh, we are not a research center, a policy shop. We don't do any direct clinical practice, but we really work at the intersection of research policy and practice to help lead collaboration and innovation in driving forward healthcare quality, safety, and equity. And we have a long history of working with rural providers, in particular critical access hospitals and state flux programs. And uh, we currently serve as the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistance Center, which is a federal office of rural health policy funded project that we implement at Stratus Health. We've been serving in that capacity for the last eight years. And in that role, we help provide uh, technical assistance to state flex programs and critical access hospitals and other rural providers around quality reporting and improvement activities. So today I'm here to talk to you about antibiotic stewardship. So specifically, we want to do a little bit of grounding and talk about the importance of antibiotic stewardship for critical access hospitals and the related MBQIP or Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Program measure. We're going to identify what the core elements of antibiotic stewardship are and how they're defined by the National Healthcare Safety Network or NHSN Annual Facility Survey. We're going to look at your current performance in Oklahoma for implementing antibiotic stewardship, which is um, captured through the most recent NHSN Facility Survey, which is the data that was submitted in early 2023, reflecting activities from the calendar year 2022. And then we'll, um, as we look through those things, we'll be discussing strategies and hoping that you all weigh in with strategies for implementing and enhancing your antibiotic stewardship program um, as you're working toward not just meeting the, the basics of the core elements, but really implementing a robust and effective antibiotic stewardship program. So before I dive in, uh, I would love if folks would be willing to weigh in in the chat and introduce yourselves, including um, for you all, it won't necessarily mean a whole lot to me, but for you all, maybe the facility that you're with or that you're representing and your role. Are you a prescriber? Are you a quality director? Are you um, a pharmacist? What role do you play in antibiotic stewardship within your facility? So we'll give everyone just a minute to weigh in here so that you can see each other. So Tamara is a CNO. Infection control. Holly, I'm going to have to ask you what DOP is. Yeah, is what? Director of Pharmacy. Oh, perfect. Uh, quality and infection prevention. Quality manager, infection control, infection control and quality. Great. 
And some of you are probably known to each other, but sometimes on these antibiotic stewardship focus calls, we end up with some folks who maybe don't join some of the other MVQIP or quality related um, initiatives. And so it's helpful to know we've got someone who's on the antibiotic stewardship committee. Uh, an LPN and drug room supervisor, infection control, consulting pharmacist for multiple rural hospitals, and an RN patient care manager. Excellent. So as I mentioned earlier, you can see there's a lot of expertise within the room. When I ask for feedback, I hope that you will weigh in in the chat or unmute and speak up if you have questions that are more technical in nature. I don't have that pharmacy or that clinical background, but you all do. So feel free to weigh in and learn from each other as well. So just a little bit of grounding and background about why we're talking about antibiotic stewardship and critical access hospitals in general. So for those of you who are maybe not as familiar, MBQIP is the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project. That is a, a program that falls within the state flex programs to implement. So Laura, within your Oklahoma State Flex Program office is working with your, your hospitals on meeting the requirements and the, reporting the measures that fall under MBQIP. MBQIP is really a, a federal office of rural health policy uh, initiative to identify a common set of rural relevant measures that are reported nationally by all critical access hospitals. And um, the goal of that is ultimately to improve patient outcomes. So we know that the adage in quality is you can't improve what you can't measure. So we start with measurement, identify opportunities for improvement, and ultimately improve patient outcomes based on those activities. So why antibiotic stewardship? You all are here. We don't have to sell you on this, but just a little bit of context. We know that antibiotic use has well-known unintended consequences, things such as B. difficile, um, are caused by inappropriate antibiotic use. We also know that it's contributing to a growing crisis of antibiotic resistance and being unable to treat folks with antibiotics that worked in the past. And antibiotic stewardship programs have been proven to be effective in mitigating those types of threats. We know that antibiotic stewardship programs improve infection cure rates, that they reduce C. difficile infection rates, that they reduce adverse events from antibiotics, and that they reduce antibiotic resistance in general. So we know that antibiotic stewardship is an effective means of addressing this crisis that we have of um, inappropriate antibiotic use. Antibiotic stewardship within MBQIP currently falls under what's called the patient safety domain of the MBQIP program. So within the program, there are a variety of different domains with measures that fall under each of them. Um, and what we're looking at for antibiotic stewardship, this is a process measure. We're looking at the implementation of the seven core elements of antibiotic stewardship. We measure that based on the self-assessment that your facility provides each year through the NHSN annual facility survey. We're going to be doing a deep dive into that today. And then this was launched prior to CMS making antibiotic stewardship a condition of participation, which went into effect back in March of 2020. So we anticipated that we would get all kinds of information from CMS about what that would look like. And then if anybody remembers March of 2020, you all were working in infection control and a lot of other things were going on at the time. So there's been a bit of a lag in terms of understanding exactly what CMS's review of meeting that condition of participation will mean. We're now three and a half years out from that, but we know that it is um, an essential component of your, um, your quality programming within your facility. So all of you likely already have a robust antibiotic stewardship program in place, but we're gonna be talking about today are ways to enhance it. When we think about the core MBQIP measures, there's a variety of different channels that measures get reported through. If you are involved in reporting, you know that you have data that goes to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services through the hospital quality reporting um, platform. This measure in particular that we're talking about today, antibiotic stewardship, is uh, outlined in red in the orange there. That's uh, reported to the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is the, uh, the data repository or warehouse for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And then on the far right, you have your emergency department transfer communication data that's reported to your state flex program. So we just always kind of try to set the stage for what are we talking about in terms of reporting. Our primary focus today is going to be on performance and improvement, but it's nice to know where the data is coming from and going to. When you're looking at the National Healthcare Safety Network Annual Facility Survey, there's a variety of different resources that are available to support you in order to report 
this measure, if as we look at the data today, you'll see that there are a number of Oklahoma critical access hospitals that did not report in the most recent period. So when we're looking at that, there are some steps that have to be taken. So if you're either participating today or you're watching the webinar later and you're wondering, how do I get this data in? If first things first, you have to be enrolled within the National Healthcare Safety Network. That sounds like an easy task, but it can be a little bit onerous. There's a lot of steps involved. Um, and so the enrollment checklist that's linked here is the way to get started if you're not already in NHSN. And then once you're in NHSN, there are different components within NHSN that allow you to report different measures. You have to add the patient safety component in order to be able to report the NHSN annual facility survey. And then you are encouraged to complete the survey by March 1st of each year. And that's the cut of data that we will be looking at is those facilities that completed the survey by March 1st of 2023 um, to reflect what they did in the previous calendar year of 2022. Any questions so far about the contexting of antibiotic stewardship within MBQIP or the data reporting piece of this? If not, we'll jump into what antibiotic stewardship implementation looks like in Oklahoma currently. So when we look at the core elements of hospital antibiotic stewardship, they are listed out here. There are seven core elements. There's leadership commit commitment, accountability, drug expertise, action, tracking, reporting, and education. And the way that a facility is um, assessed as to whether or not they have implemented these core elements is based on how they answer questions on the annual facility survey through NHSN. So again, this is a process measure. When we look at reporting um, and comparing national reporting to reporting within Oklahoma for the 2022 survey, again, that was just submitted in early 2023, nationally, 92% of critical access hospitals reported, and in Oklahoma, 33 of the 40 hospitals reported, which makes you at about 83%. When we look at uh, what it, how you are, how Oklahoma critical access hospitals are performing on antibiotic stewardship at the core element level over time, you can see that there's been an increase. So this is what we want to see. When we look at did, how many of your facilities that were reporting uh, were meeting all seven core elements. Back in 2018, there were 46 percent of cause that reported and were meeting all seven core elements. And in 2022, 79% of the cause that reported are meeting all core elements. So you can see that's been a steady increase over time. And what so that's the first column there is if you've implemented all seven. And then as you go across, you can see that it's relatively steady across each of the elements. There's some kind of rises and falls, but for the most part, it's moving, especially if you look at the 2018 versus the 2022 you can see that there's been an increase overall during that time. Some years were higher or lower than others, and that might be because some critical access hospitals reported in one year and didn't report in another year. It could also be that the person answering the survey interpreted the questions differently. Um, and so it's, uh, there's a little bit of nuance here in terms of being able to say, for example, when we look at tracking, um, in 2020, the rate was 93% of the cause that we're reporting in Oklahoma were meeting that core element, and we're down to 85% in 2022, so that sometimes that might be a, seem a little odd. Um, there's a variety of reasons for why that might be, and we would have to dig into the data more to tell us more of a story, but if we just look at the top line of 2018 versus 2022, you can see that all of them are moving in the right direction. Higher is better in this case as a process measure. This is just another way of looking at that data, showing in, in the bar graph format over time how Oklahoma critical access hospitals are faring from 2018 to 2022. Um, on the far left, we have having implemented all seven of the core elements, and then across the board, what each of those element implementation um, rates have looked like over the years. So now we're going to dive into the actual questions, and I'm going to take a little bit more time with leadership just to orient folks as to how this measure is calculated, uh, but we'll move through the other ones and open up for discussion and see how things are going in your facilities. So the way that it is determined whether or not your facility is meeting the core element of leadership 
is if your facility is able to answer affirmatively to any of the questions that are listed on this slide. So it is a relatively low bar to be able to meet that core element. So if we go back and we see that in 2022, 94% of the critical access hospitals in Oklahoma who completed the, assess the survey are meeting this core element. That means that there, 94% of you are answering yes to at least one of these questions. Many of you are obviously answering yes to more than one of them. And being able to dig into that detail and nuance is something that the State Flex program can support you with um, to understand what your opportunities are. You also have this data available to you within the NHSN um, system to be able to see how you answer these questions and, and assess what you would like to do to be able to enhance your program. So 67% of critical access hospitals in Oklahoma that completed the, the survey, so out of the 33 that completed the survey for 2022, 67% have, have a formal statement of support for antibiotic stewardship. Um, they have information on stewardship activities and outcomes that are presented to facility leadership or board at least annually. And then you can see that second one from the bottom, there's a variety of options here, that your leadership either provides stewardship program leaders dedicated time to manage the program, that you have a senior executive that serves as a point of contact or a champion, and that you ensure that the steward and or that you ensure that the stewardship program has an opportunity to discuss resource needs with facility leadership. So those are your highest performing activities within Oklahoma as a state across all of your critical access hospitals. Um, other options and ways that people are meet, uh, that facilities are meeting this requirement are communicating to staff about stewardship activities through emails, newsletters, events, and other avenues, providing opportunities for hospital staff training and development on antibiotic stewardship, allocating resources such as IT support or training for the stewardship team, um, ensuring that staff uh, from key support departments and groups such as IT or hospital medicine are contributing to stewardship activities. Those are all other ways that you are meeting this. The last one here is uh, your lowest performance as a state. So your biggest opportunity as a state. So if a physician or a pharmacist is leading the antibiotic stewardship um, activities in your facility, are those written into their contract, their job description, or their performance review? Only 24% of CAUSE in Oklahoma indicated that that is the case in their facility. So this is an opportunity, while it's only 24% and it's the lowest performing, that means 24% are doing it, which means it's possible to do. And what we know in critical access hospitals, in particular, all hospitals, but in critical access hospitals especially, is that people wear so many different hats, and often passion is what drives people's initiatives and quality improvement activities. So if you have someone who's working in the capacity of leading antibiotic stewardship activities, and they're really passionate about it, that's fantastic. If it's not written into a job description and that person leaves the facility, is there that infrastructure to ensure that those um, activities are carried forward? It's, a, it's really important to make sure that it is written into job descriptions, contracts, performance reviews. And so you have the opportunity to learn from one another how some of you have been able to accomplish that so that others of you can enhance your stewardship programs um, by doing that going forward. What you see in the middle column there is the national rate, so you can compare how Oklahoma CAUSE are doing in comparison to critical access hospitals nationally across the board for all of these different activities. Any questions about what the data is telling us here in terms of the uptake of these different activities and how you're assessed for this measure in MBQIP? If you are one of the facilities, I guess either way, if your facility has or has not written these activities into someone's job descriptions or performance review, if you would like to weigh in in the chat about how you either accomplished that or um, maybe any barriers that you've come up against or if you've even attempted to do that, um, that would be great because I think this is one of those activities that there we see that you can see that this is the lowest performing in Oklahoma. It's also the lowest performing nationally. So this is one that I always call attention to when I'm meeting with critical access hospitals and talk about the importance of really hardwiring antibiotic stewardship into the organizational structure 
that it isn't just one person's responsibility, but it is actually an activity that the organization has demonstrated that they are um, committed to by virtue of having written it into someone's job description. The next two areas, uh, the next two core elements really go hand in hand with leadership. So we see really high uptake of leadership as a core element across the board. That's because you, you really can't implement the rest of antibiotic stewardship activities if you don't have leadership buy-in. Similarly, we view kind of accountability and the stewardship pharmacy expertise or what used to be referred to as drug expertise as core foundational pieces of your antibiotic stewardship program in order to be able to get into the more nuanced pieces of implementing a robust program. So within accountability, um, does your facility have a leader or co-leaders responsible for antibiotic stewardship program management and outcomes? 91% of the facilities in Oklahoma that completed the survey said, yes, they have that. And, um, or is your antibiotic stewardship program co-led by both a pharmacist and a physician? This is a newer question. They've always kind of asked this question in some way, shape, or form, but they're now identifying, the CDC is now identifying that this co-led approach of having a pharmacist and a physician um, working together is what they're calling a, a, a priority activity. So going forward, you'll be seeing more coming out from the CDC about priority activities within implementing antibiotic stewardship, and this is something that they're going to be pushing more. So again, it's not a high uptake in Oklahoma. 21% of critical access hospitals indicated that, yes, they have this, um, but there are some that do, and so is this an opportunity for your facility? We have worked really closely with the CDC and with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy to talk about these priority activities that they're um, rolling out and thinking about what the implications are for critical access hospitals. And in some cases, resource allocation may not allow for um, some of the activities that, they've, that they would prioritize for non-critical access hospitals. Uh, but this is something that they're pushing for. And since 21% of you have it, if that's something that you're interested in learning more about how, how your um, peers were able to allocate those resources or set that up in their facility, you can connect with one another to learn more. For stewardship or pharmacy expertise, it's kind of a one or the other. So does your facility have a pharmacist lead or co-lead that's responsible for antibiotic stewardship outcomes? 64% of you indicated yes for that. Or does your facility have um, someone else who's responsible for stewardship outcomes, but there is at least one pharmacist responsible for improving antibiotic use at the facility? 21% of you indicated yes for that. So this is one of those where it's an either or proposition. You either have a pharmacist who's co-leading or you have a pharmacist who is, in the, who is responsible for supporting um, antibiotic activities in your facility. And so total overall 85% of Oklahoma cause are meeting this core element. Then we get really into the meat of antibiotic stewardship. And um, there are two slides dedicated to how you can indicate that you are taking appropriate action. So this is, the, this is really where we get into, you only have to indicate yes to one of these to get credit for implementing the core element. But those of you who are on the line are well aware that one of these things does not make a robust antibiotic stewardship program. So we really want you to be thinking, long and hard about which activities make sense in the context of your facility. And if something, if you aren't doing something, is it really because it doesn't make sense in the context or is it something that you should be thinking about implementing? Not all activities or tracking or reporting, um, not all actions, tracking or reporting activities make sense for all critical access hospitals, but you should be thinking about whether, you should have a reason for not implementing these things if you aren't doing them. So 79% of you, the highest performing um, action item in Oklahoma critical access hospital is early administration of effective antibiotics to optimize the treatment of sepsis. So that's fantastic. This is a newer question on the survey. This isn't something that we have historic data for comparison purposes because it was added more recently. They've really expanded the action item section of the survey. Um, they also have treatment for staff for bloodstream infection. They have stopping unnecessary antibiotics in new cases of C. diff. 
reviewing culture proven invasive infections, uh, review of the planned outpatient um, or the OPAT, assessing and clarifying documented penicillin allergies as an activity, uh, the antibiotic timeout, so reviewing antibiotics 48 to 72 hours after the initial order, and then using the shortest effective duration for antibiotics for common clinical conditions. So you can see in the right-hand column what the uptake of those activities are among your facilities in Oklahoma. Um, and you all would know better whether or not you should be doing all of these things or if some of these maybe aren't applicable in your facility for some reason. But for the most part, these are all best practices that we would hope to see the numbers pick up across the board for all of your facilities. Um, and if you're interested in knowing how one organization did it, again, you've got folks on the line. All of these have at least someone in Oklahoma that is doing them. And so that's an opportunity to learn from each other. This is the second slide of the activities that can get you credit for at the action item for the core element. So do you have um, these, so the top one again are those new priority interventions. So this is how you would get credit for meeting a priority activity within this area. Do you have prospective audit and feedback for specific antibiotic agents? Are you providing feedback to prescribers about which antibiotics they're prescribing? Um, are there pre is there pre-authorization in place for specific antibiotic agents? This tends to be an area where we see a lower uptake. Um, you can see that in Oklahoma, it's at 24%. And nationally, it's only at 28%. So some critical access hospitals have determined that this activity isn't um, efficient for them to implement or necessary for them to implement. Again, that's something for your stewardship committee to take a look at and determine. Um, and then, and or do you have facility-specific treatment recommendations in place? So do you have an antibiogram in place that's either based on national guidelines and local pathogen susceptibilities um, so that you can determine which which antibiotics are most useful within the population that you're serving. This has a lower uptake in Oklahoma than it does nationally, 45% compared to 71%. Um, so if you're looking for ideas for how to go about doing that, we know that some critical access hospitals struggle with um, developing a, a robust antibiogram based on low volumes and being able to maintain that. Um, so some of you might have ideas for how you've been able to accomplish that to share with one another. Pharmacy-based interventions, do you have pharmacy-driven changes from um, IV to oral antibiotics without a physician's order? Is that in place in your facilities? It's a relatively low uptake in Oklahoma at 36%. Are there alerts to providers about potentially duplicative antibiotic spectra? And do you have an automatic antibiotic stop order in specific situations such as for surgical prophylaxis? And then finally, we get into the nurse-based interventions. These are new questions on the survey as well. There's a lot of interest in being able to identify what are the nurse-based interventions. And I think that this is particularly compelling in critical access hospitals, uh, where we want to be able to spread the responsibilities and be utilizing staff to the top of their licensure. Uh, so are nurses initiating discussions with the treating team from, for switching from IV to oral antibiotics? Um, are nurses initiating the antibiotic timeout discussions with the treating team? Only 9% of critical access hospitals in Oklahoma said yes to that. You can see that's almost exactly on par with what's happened nationally. So there's a big opportunity there. And then are the nurses tracking on duration of therapy? Again, pretty low uptake both nationally and in Oklahoma for that particular activity. After you've taken action, we move into tracking. So these are the different ways that you can meet the tracking requirement. Your highest level of uptake is that your stewardship teams, 70% of your stewardship teams are monitoring antibiotic resistance patterns. Your lowest area of uptake is that only 24% of your facilities, which is just higher than the national percentage, um, are monitoring pre-authorization intervention. So tracking which agents are requested for which conditions would be an example of that. Other activities in this area are adher monitoring adherence to your facility's treatment recommendations for antibiotic selection for those common clinical conditions. Again, looking at your antibiogram, you have one in place. If you have that, if you've implemented that as an action, then are you monitoring it, uh, which is just a best practice for anything that we're doing from a quality improvement perspective. If you have a policy in place, how, how strictly is it adhered to? 
Um, are you monitoring the prospective and audit, prospective audit and feedback interventions? So again, if you've implemented that as an action, then are you monitoring um, how that's going? Do you monitor adherence of the shortest effective duration of antibiotics for common clinical conditions? Are you looking at um, antibiotic use in days of therapy per 1,000 patients or days present? Are you monitoring antibiotic use in defined daily doses per 1,000 patients a days, at least quarterly? And are you monitoring antibiotic expenditures? So I always bring attention to this last one, in particular as an example of in some facilities, it's really important to have that kind of ROI from a financial perspective to get leadership and board buy-in to the activities that you're conducting. And so being able to monitor those antibiotic expenditures, there's a significantly higher percentage in Oklahoma of Oklahoma cause that are doing that compared to the national percentage. So, so that seems to be something that's important to some of you. In some cases, in some states, the uptake on that is really nominal. And that might not be an activity that's worth your while if you have sufficient intake and you know input from your uh, from your leadership about being able to do these types of activities. So maybe you don't need to implement that, but if you want to or you think it's something that would be useful to you and you aren't currently, almost half of the hospitals in Oklahoma are doing that activity. So you've implemented your actions, you're you're tracking on your actions, and then how are you reporting out about their, your actions? So the highest uptake in Oklahoma, which is again on par with national, is that information on antibiotic use, resistance, and stewardship efforts is reported to hospital staff at least annually. So are you at least sharing that data about anti the antibiotic data that you're tracking with, um, with your prescribers and with your staff on at least an annual basis? The lowest level of uptake, both in Oklahoma and nationally, is that, uh, that um, pro providing individual prescriber level reports on antibiotic use. This, again, may not be something that you think is essential in your facility. Maybe you're able to do that by providing the unit or service specific reports to antibiotics on the antibiotic use to the prescribers, at least annually. Some facilities really leverage that competitive nature of physicians and prescribers. Uh, by providing those individual prescriber level reports. In some cases, maybe that doesn't feel like it's a necessary activity. So you can decide uh, what makes the most sense in your facility and just have a reason for why you're not doing all of these things. Um, if you have an antibiogram, are you distributing it at least annually to your um, prescribers? Do you have uh, priority antibiotic stewardship interventions such as prospective audit and feedback? So this is one of those things where Implementing the action of having prospective audit and feedback gets you credit both for the action and for reporting because it is a reporting activity, one in the same. So it's one activity that gives you credit for both. And then um, the other, the final one is the one at the top there that your leadership has demonstrated a commitment by presenting information about antibiotic stewardship interventions um, at least annually to leadership and the board. I see a question in the chat about the slides. Are folks able to see the slides still? Okay, thanks, Brooke. Sorry, Blake, I don't know what to tell you. And finally, the last uh, core element that we'll talk about is education. Uh, the highest uptake at 100% of the 33 cause in Oklahoma that completed the survey this year is that patients are provided education about important side effects for prescribed antibiotics. That seems like a slam dunk, right? You're providing that after visit summary, you're providing them with their medication information, and you're providing them with information about side effects. Um, 20, only 24% of cause in Oklahoma said that they um, have that uh, so that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're gonna have to go back and look at the data again. The prospective audit and feedback for specific antibiotic agents should get you credit across action, reporting, and education, but I think those percentages are different, so we'll need to take a look at that more closely. Um, uh, do you have uh, pre-authorization in place? Again, that's a place where you have both the education and the action should be lining up there in terms of percentages. And then providing, um, these are very broad statements. Do prescribers, nursing staff, or pharmacists receive education on optimal prescribing adverse reactions from antibiotics and antibiotic resistance at least annually? And you can see the breakdown there of 85%, 55%, 61%.
So um, making sure that those folks are getting at least annual education, there's not a, that seems like a pretty easy box to tick in terms of being able to provide that. Um, and then the final one is if you are doing individual prescriber level reports or unit or specific um, level reports, that you're using those to target feedback to prescribers about how they can improve their antibiotic prescribing and doing that at least annually. So that's a breakdown of what performance looks like in Oklahoma currently for antibiotic stewardship. Um, what I wanna do next is just move into a discussion and probably pull the slides down and open it up to hear more about what are some of the areas of implementation uh, for antibiotic stewardship that have been the most challenging for your facility. And then I do, uh, before I do that, I'll just share, there are some um, resources within the slides for some best practices. When we talk about antibiotic stewardship, the best practices are these activities that they're laying out here. So really looking at making sure that you're doing each of these different activities. And again, if you aren't, that there's a compelling reason for why you're not doing them in your facility, there may be, you just need to know what that is. I, if I were responsible for it, I think I would take these slides and just write out next to them, like, this is a priority that we want to implement, or this is something that we're not going to do, and here's why. And then you could review it each year to determine whether or not those are activities that you want to be um, adopting or adapting into your work plans for the year. So my question is, what areas of antibiotic stewardship implementation have been the most challenging for your facility? And um, I would encourage folks, if you're able, to turn on your, turn on your cameras uh, and unmute and share with each other, uh, because as you're sharing what your challenges are, others might have some solutions or suggestions to make you as far as what you could be doing uh, to be able to accomplish those. So thank you, Brooke, for speaking up first. Tracking is the hardest part. The computer system, um, yes. Yeah. Definitely, we've heard that electronic health records can be a particularly tricky piece of some of the tracking. Uh, if you don't have discrete data fields, if you're having to use your notes field and then pulling information out of there or asking folks to, to put in the notes field in a particular way and not everyone's following that. Um, so if, if, you know, the other thing is, is that if you're willing to share, if tracking is the hardest part because of your computer system, if you want to share what your EHR is, maybe there's someone else on the call who has the same EHR and has come up with a workaround or something that's working for them. Um, so that would be great. I'm going to stop my share. Oh, you use Excel for tracking. Okay. And you're using CPSI and evidence for your EHR. Melva, I'm wondering if you can say more about um, the struggles that you have with getting non-employee buy-in. So feel free to unmute. So having having agencies here and uh, contract providers um, getting just getting them to buy in. To, and understand we are tracking what they're what they're doing as far as the providers, but you know just getting their, their buy in because they're only here and then they're gone. So yeah. And do you find that to be an issue across other quality initiatives as well, or is it a specific issue as it relates to antibiotic stewardship? No, it's not specific to that. Yeah. I ask because I'm curious if anyone has come up with any useful mechanisms for maybe other quality initiatives that you could that could be adapted or utilized in this context specifically. We know, especially since um, March of 2020, as the pandemic kind of rolled through and we started to see folks leaving for you know, traveling nursing jobs, and then you're hiring back the nurses that you had on staff as traveling nurses, and what does that look like, and all of those things, and um, in particular, that feels like it's been um, a, a challenge for critical access hospitals over the last three, three and a half years, uh, even more so than in the past, even with using locums and things like that. Um, so if anyone has any suggestions of ways that you've been able to address buy-in from non-employees who are providing care in your facilities 
for antibiotic stewardship or any other quality initiatives. I think that's a really worthwhile discussion to have. So Tamara, I'm, so staff turnover and turnover with our lead. So I'm curious if you know if your facility is one of the ones that has this written in, in someone's job description. Yes, we do. Okay. And and is the so so the so leadership is committed to it regardless of the turnover, yes. but it's just getting uh -huh. someone new up and running on board. Right. Is there any activities that are happening? And Laura, this question might be for you at a state level to be able to help onboard folks into an antibiotic stewardship lead role. Um, by connecting them with their peers at other facilities? So that's something we would love to do. I don't get asked often in this area, but for folks on the call, um, if you do have someone new or coming on board, I'm happy to put you in touch with another facility. It'd be most of you guys on this call that I'd probably be reaching out to to ask um, to be a peer. So this topic amongst many other topics. If you want to know, um, if you'd like for us to put you in touch with another peer facility, we are more than happy to do so. Brandon says that they have EPIC and working to enhance your report through that are available through that. Kelly, I'm not familiar with Action Q. I don't know if other folks on the call are, or if you want to speak to what that is. Maybe that's familiar to everyone else, and I'm I'm in the dark. Oh, connecting to audio. Do other folks know what Action Q is? I only know because I've reached out to her myself. Um, they are a vendor who provides okay. support in this area. Okay, got it, great. Sounds like a few of you are using uh, Google Docs or Excel for your tracking. Um, when you talk about using them for tracking, what, what, are you, what data are you tracking through Excel or um, Google Docs? versus what you're collecting in your electronic health record, or is it that you're pulling data out of your EHR and monitoring it through an Excel-based tool? Anyone willing to share? Darcy, can I call on you? You're pulling data out of Cerner and placing it into Excel, things like diagnoses, antibiotic type, within four hours of admissions, appropriateness. Okay. So you're you're collecting the data through the electronic health record and then you're using Excel as a tracking tool. Says tracking UTI diagnoses and following up on culture reports and antibiotics. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sorry, my okay. uh, microphone wasn't set up. So with Cerner, it's hard for us to pull things back out. So we have to use Excel in order to track, um, you know, appropriateness and if we need to follow up on antibiotics and change them or if they weren't prescribed at all. So it's pretty a, a pretty detailed Excel sheet, um, but that's the only way that we can kind of keep a running tab um, constantly. And then since you unmuted Darcy, 
What do you do with that information after you track on it? What does the reporting out and sharing of that information look like with staff? So uh, we split, I split the Excel sheet. Um, pretty much there's like a sheet per provider. So each provider can then see their specific um, activity for the month of um, how many were prescribed unnecessarily or necessarily, and it was the wrong type, et cetera. Um, and then we report that on to med staff and board. Yep. So lots of folks pulling data out of your, so it sounds like it's probably manual abstraction that's happening to then be able to put things into another Source, data source for tracking. I'm curious if any of your facilities are reporting to the antibiotic use module in NHSN, the AU module. Sarah, we had um, a comment from Susan in the chat um, about their drug room tracking, but she also asked, can you discuss or are you aware of the CMSN NHSN requirement that is due in January 2024? Is this a monthly required upload or an attestation of yes, no? I understand. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, what I can tell you is so the, um, I believe what you're referring to, Susan, and correct me if I'm wrong, is related to the promoting interoperability requirements related to antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance reporting. Okay, thank you. So, um, so here's the thing with that. CMS set up the requirements for the Promoting Interoperability Program, which is one of, if not the only, CMS-driven quality reporting program that directly applies to critical access hospitals. So if you're not successful, you stand to lose some funds as a result. Um, they set up antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance as though they are one measure when in reality with an NHSN, they are two different things. So the exemption for the antibiotic resistance reporting is relatively broad sweeping. And we anticipate that most critical access hospitals will be exempted from AU and AR in whole due to being exempted from the AR requirement, which has to do with your clinical lab systems that you have to have in place for the antibiotic resistance tracking and reporting. Um, if, you if you are not exempted, you are expected to report. And I can't tell you off the top of my head what the requirements are, I can look into it, but I can tell you that we are featuring a guest article in the MBQIP monthly newsletter that's coming out at the end of August that was written by one of our colleagues and counterparts at the CDC, specifically regarding the requirements around antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance reporting. So watch for that article. And in the meantime, I can pull the information out of that, send it to Laura and she can get it off to all of you. I don't wanna misspeak and misrepresent anything. Um, we, we don't anticipate that most critical access hospitals will actually have to report because we anticipate that most of you will be exempted due to the systems requirements that need to be in place. But if you do have those systems requirements in place, I have the information about what's required. I just would be remiss if I spoke about it out of turn because I know just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> do you know, Susan, if you have all of the necessary systems for reporting AU and AR? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Most of my facilities use CPSI evidence, and they do not have the proper file to upload directly to NHSN. There are some of those independent vendors out there that you can contract with, which are costly. And um, so I'm just trying to figure out. I have one of my IT people. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay that um, have said, oh, well, we don't have to, we just have to attest. And I had understood, no, we needed to. And so I'm trying to, you know, on the back end decide, do we need to sign this contract with these vendors to, as our, you know, transition piece between Evident and NHSM um, versus are we gonna be able to opt out? Because CPSI can do the AU, but not the AR part. 
Um, yeah. And so, and there's quite a few that are on that list. They're on the AU list, but not on the AR list. And some of them don't have the lab integrated in for the AR part. So it's like, do you encourage them to incur this large expense when they don't have to? Um, so that's kind of what I've been trying. I can't find a great clear anything on CMS that says, oh, this is how, you know, except for that it's due and that we need to do it. But I don't want them to have to pay for a vendor that they don't aren't going to need, if yeah. that makes sense. Yep, it does. And the way that CMS set it up again is it's C CDC, if you talk to them, they view it as two separate measures. There's antibiotic use and there's antibiotic resistance, and they have different requirements. And critical access hospitals, for the most part, should be able to report antibiotic use and would be encouraged to do so because there's benefit in doing that. As all of you have indicated, you're manually tracking a lot of that information because you find value in it and it's important for your antibiotic stewardship program. But the way that CMS set it up, it's an all or nothing proposition. You can't get credit just for reporting AU. You either report both of them or you don't. And you're either exempt across the board or you're expected. So um, so it's a, a, I don't know what that will look like in the future. I don't know if at some point CMS might separate those out and say, you should be doing AU and you should be doing AR and either do those or indicate that you're exempt for them for different reasons or if they'll keep them together, but currently they are, an, a, it's an all or nothing proposition. Any final thoughts, comments, questions, Laura, anything that I missed in chat? Um, we had a great response in the chat. Um, Brooke commented when you asked the question, you know, what, what are folks using the data for? What are they doing? She noted facility-wide the IP is tracking antibiotic resistance and medical floor watches for culture reports, receive depth or discharge, and tracking appropriate antibiotic use during hospitalization. So um, thank you guys for the great feedback um, and input in this call. It's always great to hear peers um, discussing and also just the dialogue with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And again, there's so much knowledge in this Zoom room and in these black squares on the screen. Um, so, you know, definitely leverage your connections with each other or tap into Laura to help you make those connections with one another. Uh, that's a big part of what the FLEX program's role is, is to help you all um, connect with each other so that you can do what's best for your, your facilities and your communities. Yes, and um, as we move forward, if you have any questions or, hey, do you know of another facility that's doing this, please let me know. I'm happy to put you in touch with another facility. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for such a great webinar um, and leading such a great webinar. We, um, we've really appreciated all, the, all your expertise and all of your um, guidance that you've provided to us over the years. Thank you, Laura, much appreciated. So with that said, if there are no further questions, we'll go ahead and give you guys about seven minutes back to your day, but please feel free to reach out with any questions or concerns. Um, I did have the question come up a few times in the chat about the slides. I do have Sarah's slides from today. When we get the recording posted on YouTube, I will send that link out along with the slides. So we'll all be in one email together. But please reach out if you have any questions or concerns and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.